waiting for a Bible. Or he can get it when, it, I mean, we can take it when, it, is he here? I can't see that. Do you have your phone? Yeah. Do you want to, you can pull up the ESV or yeah, King think. James, whichever version you prefer. <laughs> ESV. Hey, so uh, Jonathan, I'm glad you're here. Thanks I've, for having me. No, really, I've been wanting to get you up here for a while and you uh, you waited till the studio was ready and Luther was glaring at you and. There he is. Yeah, there he is. That is a bit of a glare, but that makes sense <laughs> for Luther. I want to talk to you about uh, a couple things. So, of course, your books, which, the, well, the ones we've published. Did we publish Hymns of Devotion? Uh, no, but you are the sole distributor of Hymns of Devotion. So Okay, that's for the audience. Let's talk about this first because I'm the least familiar with sure. this yeah, book. Sure, yeah, great. So... Um, these are hymns written by you? The words, correct. The words. Yeah. Oh, who did the music? A, v- a variety of people. So uh, let's see, that, that booklet, Hymns of Devotion, was uh, the occasion for this being put together and bound was for the 40th anniversary of um, uh, my, the congregation I serve. This is kind of a, a gift we gave to, to the people there. Um, so I've been writing hymns since 2013, the texts, and... In that time, um, this is 25 hymns that we put together. There's more than that, but these are ones I felt were worthy of being <laughs> printed and published. About, um, I would say, uh, probably almost 20 of these are put to new tunes. The rest are familiar tunes. Um, and there's a number of composers. I think there's at least four in this this booklet. Since then, I've gone on to write with a number of other composers, but uh, friends of mine uh, who have degrees in things like composition mm-hmm. <laughs> and music theory, who know much more about that than I do. I'm, I'm somewhat but musically... you play piano. Right. I'm somewhat musically inclined. I play piano, and I yeah. like uh, uh, fiddling around on the piano as well and, and coming up with tunes and stuff, but I don't really know that art or that yeah. craft, I should say. Yeah. And so um, uh, Josh Bowder is one who... Um, Uh, Now I've been collaborating with, uh, he's a Baptist um, professor of of music theory and a church musician out in St. Paul area, teaches at a couple universities there and uh, has been writing sacred music for a number of years. Some of the stuff's really well known and done by um, uh, choirs and church, Mm -hmm. church choral groups. And um, it was really, it was really interesting. I found one of his pieces in the summer, this past summer, and I was just really moved by it. It was a, a setting to a familiar tune, but a, a, I mean, to a f- familiar hymn text, but a new tune that he composed that really just drew out. Um, some some listeners will know what God ordains is, or what what air my God ordains is right is one of the versions. It's a German poem that's brought into English. He took a newer translation uh, uh, that goes. Um, um, what what God ordains is always good, mm. and so it's a fresh text, a fresh tune, and I just thought, wow, this is beautiful, this is amazing. And on a limb, I've never done this, but I found this website, and I just said, hey, you don't know me from Adam, and I don't know you, but your hymn tune was amazing. Would you be interested in in writing new stuff for for some new texts? And he wrote back within an hour, and he said, Jonathan, you won't believe this, but your book, What Happens When We Worship, I use as a textbook mm. for a class I teach at the university on church worship, or on liturgics. <laughs> and so here I knew his hymns, and he knew my my um, writing on, on worship, and so uh, we became fast friends, and we've done uh, about a half dozen hymns together. So they're not in that, but we're hoping to put together a collection in the yeah. future. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love finding finding people um, throughout the, the um, church. Uh, I've got friends composing down in the South, and he's in the Midwest, and some in the Caribbean. Um, just wonderful to use the different gifts of God's people um, and to collaborate in that way to present something for for the whole church. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah. that's a real passion of mine, and something I continue to do as the Lord um, gives inspiration for it. So it's interesting you're you're writing these um, as a pastor yourself. So Correct. You're not like yeah. a full time songwriter. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not planning to move to Nashville anytime soon. Okay, okay. Well, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons. Yeah, I mean Nashville's a great place. <laughs> no, yeah, but, but I mean for my future prospects and and 
my career, probably a good don't thing not to. Yeah, yeah, don't have a chance. Okay. Um, do these do these come out of your study, like for sermons yes. in particular, like week by week? You're preparing, you're getting ready, and um, in all seriousness, are these kind of like? I know for a lot of us, we are in the middle of research or study, whether it's for a book or a sermon, and you hit these rabbit trails, you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I wish I knew, I wish I could spend time reading on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, are these a way to kind of um, deal with procrastination? <laughs> <laughs> it, that has certainly come about, that's that's for sure. You know, it's like, wow, I spent way too much time on that this week. Um, that's but not, it's productive. That's, it's productive it's productive. It's productive procrastination. Yeah. But no, I would say that the goal, though, is, is twofold. First... Um, they're called hymns of devotion in part because it's a devotional exercise for myself. Um, I I find that uh, I commune closely with God as I wrestle with with hymn texts and poetry. How can I bring out the rich theology in the scriptures and even the language of the scriptures in a way that's um, poetically beautiful mm-hmm. and memorable and something that could eventually be singable? Mm-hmm. Um, so so I feel close to God when I do that, and it's it's. It's part of the diet of my devotional life. Um, but the second reason is pastoral. Um, like you mentioned, uh, it, it comes out of my sermon preparation. Um, not all the time, not all those hymns I can say, oh yeah, that was for this sermon. Or, But um, if you look at, if you think of the great hymn writers, and I'm not suggesting I'm one of them, but, but guys like um, John Newton, just to name one, but you know, the Wesley Brothers, as well, um, John in particular, the, they're pastors, they're full-time yeah. ministers. Yeah. And if you look at uh, only hymns by Newton, each each hymn um, of the first book, the only hymns is, is broken up into three books, each hymn of the first book um, is is an exposition of a, of a text, and it's a text he was preaching. <laughs> so, you know, you have a whole hymn based on for example, um, Elijah being fed by the ravens in First Kings chapter seventeen. You know, who would think to write a hymn about that? And you read it, and you're like, "Wow, I never." It, it helps me understand that passage better. And mm-hmm. so he's got one on Samson and so forth. And so you can you can see they're they're rising out of his pastoral calling, yeah. um, and to and um, to enhance the preaching of the word. Right? Yeah. This will draw. Yeah. And so um, that's what I aim to do. Uh, sometimes I'll write um, hymns to enhance a, a series. Like, this, we're going to sing this hymn as we work through this book of the Bible because I tried to draw out the major themes of this book of the Bible in this hymn. So it's something that kind of helps the congregation um, digest what, what else they're going to be hearing in, the, in yeah. the preaching of the Word. So, I, you know, I have a new one um, that I just introduced to my congregation the other week that will uh, accompany an upcoming sermon series on Romans 8. Um, God is for me, right? Uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? Mm-hmm. So drawing out some of those themes, also the the line that God works all things together for the the good of those who who love Him. That that's in this hymn as well. So yeah, I, I think pastorally, that's that's a major aspect of of why I want to write these hymns. I don't write them just for myself, although that's part of it. But I I, I want them to be sung. I want them to be helpful. I mm-hmm. want them to be another avenue of the ministry of the word um, coming as a means of grace to God's people. How does your uh, how does your congregation feel about that? Was it hard at first to get them to sing these brand new hymns, or are you using um, are the compositions such that they're familiar enough, and it's just the words they need to grasp? Yeah. Or do you prep them before Sunday mm-hmm. and say, "Hey, this week we're going to be seeing this. Here's a really raw recording of it being yep. done." How all do you, how all do you, the above, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, like I mentioned, they'll just be set to familiar tunes, and yeah. that kind of goes over fine. Nobody has any trouble singing through those. Um, when it's set to a new composition, um, I will always um, make a point, and you know, this is something. Uh, I recognize maybe is unique to what we're doing at, at my church because of my uh, background in church music, the number of church musicians I'm friends with and, and that kind of thing. Um, but but I never want to introduce a new hymn in the middle of a service. Hey, mm. turn to this page, and you've never saw this before, but let's sing out to God's glory, which it just turns into a train wreck. Yeah. So usually the week before, um, 
whenever we're, whenever I'm able, uh, we'll have 20 minutes before the the service, uh, a hymn sing or you know song service. Some mm-hmm. people would call it, but that's when I would introduce a new hymn. Okay. And and I will work. It's not just here. You now you've heard it, and you better do better. You know, next week, <laughs> it's I'll play the melody one line at a time and. I'll sing it. Now you sing it back to me. Oh, that wasn't quite, you didn't quite get that line. Let's work on this line again. Yeah. Um, and, and that just goes with my philosophy of preparing for worship in general. Yeah. You know, yeah. even if we're singing um, hymns that everybody's heard of before, you know, um, mm-hmm. when I survey the wondrous cross, amazing grace, whatever, we put that all into our weekly liturgy and in and, and our church, and I know many others do this as well, uh, we upload that online. And, and the reason is um, we want people to be looking at that before Sunday. So it goes up on Friday. And so that can be part of family worship. Review what scriptures are we going to be reading? Re- read them over a few times. Get ready to receive, you know, the the implanted word from the, from the preacher. Mm-hmm. Which hymns are we singing? Are you not familiar with any of them? Well, if they're in the hymnal, why don't you go over them? We have websites that can play that raw recording and and get you familiar with it. Um, basically, it's it's. Th- the devil doesn't want us to be prepared for worship. The devil doesn't want us to engage actively in worship. And so anything that's distracting in worship for him is a win. Yeah. Uh, and no pastor wants that for his people, for yeah. himself, right? So whatever we can do to remove those kinds of barriers, um, uh, we should be doing. And so having having a liturgy or having the, the bulletin, the order of service, whatever you want to call it, beforehand is such a simple thing, but if congregants take that seriously by looking over, it's a, it's a huge help mm-hmm. um, just to know what to expect and um, uh, help them in their prayers before before Sunday worship. So um, yeah, so when, when introducing new hymns, uh, people haven't complained to me yet, maybe they're just kind, <laughs> but <laughs> also try not to overwhelm people. And this is true, even not just of my hymns, but other uh, hymns that, you know, I, I try to introduce uh, uh, other newer songs from other um, gifted songwriters. Um, we don't usually do more than one a month or every two months, and then we'll we'll work on it for that time. So mm-hmm. if we we get a new one, we're going to sing it the next week too, and and yeah. maybe the week after, but that time in the evening service instead of the morning service. So so we're just getting familiar with it, and then it becomes part of our repertoire. Mm-hmm. You know, now this mm-hmm. is this is one of the songs we know and we can return to it in six months. Mm-hmm. Um, which is better than just here. This song is perfect. You've never heard it, but it's perfect for this sermon. So we're going to sing it for this one sermon. Never sing it again. Well, if they'd ever heard it, it's a train wreck that Sunday. And then if you're never going to do it again, why even do it that Sunday? <laughs> you know. So, yeah. so trying to teach the congregation um, uh, and and broaden our our collective horizons, our our, our um, yeah, as I mentioned, our repertoire, our collection of of songs, hymns, spiritual songs that we are comfortable uh, singing out in, in, in praise to God. Mm-hmm. So you just, um, you just talked about order of worship, and this is, a, this is a nice segue into your book, What Happens When We Worship. You're welcome for that. that, that the seg- segue? The segue, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because my job is hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to sit here and listen to you and think about And think I'm of the next thing, you. yeah. <laughs> um. What, and what, sitting and listening to me is hard enough. <laughs> I actually enjoy it. <laughs> I have Luther glaring at me, like watching my every listen, watching, my every move. Watching your every listen. There you go. Yeah. 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 So one thing I wanted from this book. Okay. It was, and maybe it's just me, I wanted an appendix with uh, the reformed order of worship. Mm, mm -hmm. Because I don't come from a capital R Reformed background. Sure. I come from a a more evangelical background, uh, Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's Church. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with either back coming from either background. Um, And what's interesting is actually in the foreword, if I recall, Michael Horton, which it's great you got him to write your foreword, but he, he talks about how his family decide to visit a Reformed church like across the street or mm-hmm. some, something yeah. like that. Yeah, right. And um, it was very different from what they had experienced beforehand. So I guess we could say that we could generalize and say that the typical, let's just say conservative uh, church experience of our day and age right now is, well, you talk about this too, it has its own liturgy in a way, which is... Uh, 
we have our opening song, and then we have some announcements, and then maybe we have some more music, and then we have a talk. Mm-hmm. Some people still call it a sermon. Some people. Some people. Um, and then, and there may be a video presentation in there or as part of the sermon or talk. And then we have um, a short prayer and some a closing song mm-hmm. or some closing music. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like modern church liturgy. Yeah. The but, song, the song sandwich, some singing, sermon, some singing. Yeah, that's yeah. probably a good way to think of it. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I'm not putting any judgment on that. You're free to if you want to, but I'm the host. I can't do that. But y- you are presenting here something different. However, what I would have loved to have seen and why I'm glad you're here is because I wanted to ask you in person. Walk me through what a reformed order of worship looks like and why is it any different than what we've just kind of outlined? Yeah, well, you're right. There isn't um, an appendix that just gives it to you. You kind of have to read. It's not a criticism of your book, by the way. I just it's allowed to be. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying that you have to. Uh, there, there isn't one page in the back that gives it to you. You have to read the whole book and kind of put it together yourself. So um. <laughs> you're making us do the work. Thanks. Actually, there is. I, I have to qualify this. I have to come back on what I just said because I think actually in here you do give somewhat of a yes, you do. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't. You I, do, but it's not explicit. It's um, chapter thirteen. <clears throat> you me, walk through here. You look, can look at it yourself. Yeah. What did I write here? I think your chapter headings themselves are the. Well, that's uh, what I was going to say. That if you look at the table of contents, that's kind of it gives you. Uh, God calls us. The verdict is pronounced, which has to do with the cleansing portion of worship, the preaching. Then we talk about the Lord's Supper, the benediction, and the chapter thirteen is about singing, which infiltrates all of those. Um, so it's kind of there, but you know, if you look at Brian Chapel's um, Christ-centered worship or Johnny Gibson and Mark Ergney's Reformation worship, they're replete with these sort of a. Um, charts tables mm. that kind of are more helpful in that sense so yeah no there isn't there is anything like that there um and part- I, under- I understand you you are writing for people that are probably more ex- have been more exposed to a classic reformed partly order of yeah partly the idea was that for people like me who grew up in it but didn't get it you know let's explain the stuff you've been exposed to your whole life that you've taken for granted but it's also meant to be a, a helpful introduction to people who are completely unfamiliar with it. Uh, but to get back to your question that like, what would it look like? We, you know, we need to kind of answer that somewhat broadly because there is no chapter verse in scripture that says, and the proper uh, worship service will look like X. It opens with this and then you move to this and then, but uh, I think we can, um, th- what we, c- what we can do is, is take uh, scriptural principles that, that help us um define and delineate what a worship service should look like generally. So, for example, if I could work through some of those principles, yeah. um, the first uh, would be that there's a, a, a regulative principle. That's a, a common phrase in reform parlance. We mm-hmm. believe in the, the RPW, the regulative principle of worship, which simply states um, that God's Word regulates constrains, dictates what goes on in worship. We can't just make it up. We can't just make it up, yeah. Right. It, um, which, that would be uh, in contradistinction to the normative principle of worship, which says, and again, they're faithful believers who hold to, to this as well, so I'm not trying to um, uh, demean anybody, but there's just a difference, right? The Reform says the Word of God regulates, meaning, he, meaning that He tells us um, how he wants us to worship and what should be in worship. The normative principle says as long as God hasn't forbidden it, it's permitted. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, Reformed liturgies hold to this regulative principle, so we want to have in worship what God says should be in worship. Uh, we get that sometimes uh, prescriptively, sometimes descriptively um, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 in particular, it's helpful. We're told that the, you know, the church devoted themselves... Uh, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, the Lord's Supper, to mm-hmm. the prayers, uh, the prayers of the church. Um, so, so these are things which we see both described and prescribed for us. This is what you know worship should consist of. Other places in Scripture, um, Paul writing to Timothy, devote yourself to the public, you know, 
reading of, of the Word of God and, and, and so forth. So we have this regular principle. That's, that's the yeah. foundational one, yeah. um, that God, God does care about. Uh, God doesn't just care that we worship. God cares how He is worshipped. And we could go back mm. to, um, um, you know, in, inferences in that from the Second Commandment, um, things we see in the Old Testament in terms of uh, Nadab and Abihu offering up strange fire. It's not the way in which God prescribed it, and therefore there was judgment. That's that's a first principle. Uh, a second principle is also very important. We call that the dialogical principle of worship, which teaches that um, in worship, we are actually meeting with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's kind of the big idea of, of my book. <laughs> um, years and years ago, that was kind of the aha moment I had um, in my own life when I realized that's what makes this so special. <laughs> it's so simple. I mean, it's like so obvious, um, but it really does transform the way we think about worship if we recognize God's actually there. Um, this isn't just, it isn't simply a group of believers coming together to fellowship, to do something productive amongst themselves. We're coming together because God calls us, and He calls us to meet with Him, right? He doesn't call us just to be together, He calls us to meet with Him. Mm-hmm. And so if we're with Him, then uh, it follows that that He's part of this, of this um, event, and that's why we call it a dialogue is taking place. God speaks to us, and we respond back to Him. And so that dialogical principle helps us start to structure a service in, in a way that you will see generally in most Reformed churches. Um, it, it, dif- it differs, right? It, my church looks different even than another, and I, I belong to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, looks different from the nearest OPC, you know, um, in Wyoming, Michigan. It's just 40 minutes away, but things are a little different, but the principle still is there. So the idea would be, um, and this is g- generally the, the layout I have in the book, it begins with God. Um, he's the one calling the, the meeting, so of course He speaks first. He does that in the call to worship. Um, the call to worship, the minister proclaims usually from a passage of Scripture, the Psalms, um, you know, let us kneel and bow down, let us worship our Maker, Psalm 100, let us enter His courts with praise, passages like that, which are, we believe, a declaration from God to come and to engage in this activity. God speaks. Um, that's a high calling, isn't it, though, mm. right? You come and give me the honor that's due my name. Worship me in the splendor of holiness, Psalm 29. Well, holy splendor, I, these aren't words that describe me today, God. I don't know if they describe me any day. I'm a sinner. I, I'm, I'm, I'm before you. I'm, I'm, I'm finite, and I'm frail, and I'm weak. And so we respond then with a prayer, the invocation. Yeah. Lord, yeah. you've called us to this mighty task. We can't do it without you. Please help us. So God speaks, we respond, then God answers that prayer with the greeting. Um, And I'm describing, this is the order of worship we have in our church. Some churches open with the greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father. You know, this is, we start with grace. Um, uh, The the order that that we have, which is also common in Reformed churches, I think, of starting with the call, which gives us the sense of helplessness, we pray to the Lord to aid us, and then grace, right? No, I know you're you're incapable, you're unworthy, but I'm here not as your judge, but as your kind Father, and and you come in the mediation of the Son with whom I'm well pleased. God assures us of, uh, assures us of that straight at the beginning, mm. and if I can interject, yeah, here, go ahead. Yeah. The, um, one of the one of the statements you make in the book that I think stood out to me the most is um, I'm paraphrasing, you, yeah. But the the primary agent of worship is God, and actually the way that you wrote it was, yeah, the primary work of worship is done by God Himself, and that that to me that is the most profound statement that I read in your book, and it caused me to stop and just think for a while about the fact that, you know, we acknowledge um, in the Reformed tradition that God is the primary agent of salvation and Mm -hmm. the motivator or the catalyst of our sanctification, Mm -hmm. and of course, the initiator of our ultimate redemption, the consummation of all things. So he, he in all things, is... uh, 
he initiates. But um, this goes a bit beyond that. It's in the sense that the work itself, not just the initiation of the work, it's not, it's not just that he calls us, come and do something now you do for it. me. Right. It's that, well, come and do something that you can only do because I'm doing it Absolutely. through you. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you even wrap your mind around that? I mean, it's when not, I go it, to church yeah. on Sunday this week, that's all I'm going to be thinking about. And then I'm going to be looking around thinking, I wish everyone knew this mm. or was thinking this because... Yeah. It's all grace. It's all grace. It is. It is. But we so often get... We, meaning, again, it's a generalization, but I think we get so often get wrapped up. We're so gospel-centered, which is good and mm -hmm. it's necessary, that um, we kind of stop, stop at the cross instead of moving... Uh, forward with it, as it were, not leaving it behind. Yeah. And what I mean by that is um, it's all about that moment of salvation. And then we fail to acknowledge that, well, actually, God is doing Then the rest now. is up to us, right? It's yeah. Like, God yeah. is doing now. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by the primary agent or first mover, however you, we yeah, want to talk right, about right. it, right? Yeah. And so... That's so contrary to the way that, even for myself, I have to admit, the way that I've thought about church for so many years is, what's the place that we go to learn about God? And so, of course, I want solid preaching. I mm -hmm. want good expository sermons. Mm -hmm. It's the place that we go to fellowship. Yeah, we want to be around other believers, the All assembly true. of God. Mm -hmm. I know I've read that in Acts many times. Um, it's the place we go, especially having lived in England the last decade, it's the place we go to, well, you describe it as the feast with God, but partake in the Lord's Supper. It's mm -hmm. a very big part of the Anglican Church. Yeah. And um, that's something you do every single week, uh, is that that uh, communion with God. Yeah, kind and, of culminates. capital C communion, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then music becomes this thing of, of kind of like experiencing God. It's weird. I mean, I think that's the way that a lot of us think about it is unless we've had someone come along and say, well, no, actually, look, this is this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. Music isn't just the touchy feely part of it. And it's also not the the, the worship part of it. That's that's the real trouble. Right. And then the rest when people, is. Hey, worship was really like, great today. Got worship, preaching and prayer. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, they actually, mean the music. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I know. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm just bringing that up because um, the reason I interjected is because yes the main point of your book which i think s all of christianity needs to hear is that um it's uh it's church is when we meet with god actually actually really and actually truly. really and truly meet with and because god. god is a supernatural being that meeting by nature by definition is itself supernatural mm -hmm. so we should not be surprised to learn that god is working in us to produce this thing that we could not do on our own which is to offer him the praise that's due his name okay so good but <laughs> <laughs> And Which is to agree with your earlier point, right? Yeah. Sure. He's the primary one that's making this possible. But why does it feel boring? <laughs> Seriously, why does church feel boring? If that's actually what's happening. I know. Why I'm, does I'm it laughing feel boring? because so I don't cry. <laughs> and then the other thing is this, is why is it that, you know, a short backstory, we, we did just move back from England. It's been about a year now. Yeah. And we've done... We're you know, glad to have you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't go to your church, but thank you. I meant in America. Thanks. I am American, by the way. We um, have been on the church tour. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. you do. You, you have gotta to. You've got to find your you church. Have to. Yeah. But it's been, uh, without naming any churches, mm -hmm. some have been very fun and loud and <laughs> engaging. On a certain level. Okay, and then Enga other, engaging, I would take over loud, but yeah, got you. I yeah. understand. And then other <laughs> churches have been um, boring and dull. Yeah. And it's been hard to find a church where we feel like this is authentic in the sense of not just how people are engaging with you, like mm -hmm. the facade has been dropped a bit and we're like, hey, we really do care about you and um, 
we want to get to know you, but also authentic in the sense of we're actually trying to uh, engage with God. Yeah. And not just either on one hand, give you an experience so you feel great about yourself, or on, on the other hand, stick to stick so rigidly to what we've done for the last however many years. Because it's the only way to do it. And that's and how we do it. And if you venture out of that, you're being unbiblical. Yeah. Big question. Why is church boring? Yeah, so that's the that's the question. Why why because even in that um the TED Talk type that you describe it as, which I think is pretty mm-hmm. valuable, TED Talk with music, is that gets um onerous on its own right. Be- you know, the one one might be seem like dull, stuffy, boring. Um, Con- but, it seems contrived, right? Is that yeah, what you mean and by this feels yeah. contrived, which yeah. starts to to feel, in its own way, uh, I think boring is the wrong word, but it's inauthentic. So P- pedan- I think pedantic, com- right? Pedantic, but I think ultimately it comes down to an inauthenticity mm-hmm. that when you leave the building, you're thinking, I don't f- really think I met with God, except when I was praying, Lord, help me to get through this next hour. <laughs> I've prayed that many times. I'm not joking. Right? No, that's, that's I should probably add that to my arsenal too of, of <laughs> prayers. You know, like you're right. <laughs> Lord, help me to in, in, as best as I can to honor you even through this, what's what feels like a train wreck, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, <laughs> just, to, just to articulate it maybe a bit better is why, why is church boring yeah. if... This is true. We're that engaging. We're, with we're God. supposed to be engaging with God. Okay. In, in so I've time. got a lot of answers swirling around my head, and I want to try to get them out there before I forget. Um, the one thing was though about the the TED Talk kind of presentation. It on its own can seem, or after a while, right? At first, it's like, oh, this is great. Maybe even for the first few months, but then it's like, what feels inauthentic about it is that it's um, so predictable. It's so scripted. It's so mm. cue the music now, turn the lights down now, get your, you know, feel that emotional um, uh, vibe at this particular point. And that's where it starts to feel onerous, contrived, pedantic, whatever we want to call it. But also, sorry to interject again. It also feels like I'm being... Uh, Manipulated? Uh, no, no. Well, sure. But um, it feels like kind of a, like Sunday school. Like when you're a child in Sunday school, what I don't know if you believe in Sunday school, but when I you... believe that they happen, and they, I, don't, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but we have them at our church. <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, cleared that hurdle. Sunday school feels like a teaching context, sure, rather than an, an engaging with God. Yes, context. yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. My my point was going to be, even though all that's true about uh, this. TED Talk type of church that we, we have kind of caric- caricatured for the purposes of our discussion, somebody could turn around and say the same thing about what I've presented. Look, it's the same thing every week. I mean, our liturgy rarely changes. How is that also yeah. not contrived yeah. and all this? And that's when we come back to the regulative principle. Okay, it's one thing for the scheme of man to feel onerous, right? That you've come up with this and now it's starting to feel burdensome and boring, right? But when what we, the activity that we engage in in worship, when it's dictated by God's word, even if it follows the same pattern week to week, to know that this comes from God and this is of God relieves that sense of, oh, this again, Mm. right? Because we know it's not a contrivance, um, this is something that's been divinely given to us for our good. So that that helps at least in that area. Um, back to the broader question of why is church boring? A couple answers. Uh, one reason that church is boring is because the, the leadership of the church doesn't do a good job of conveying to the worshipers that what is taking place is that we're meeting with God. Um, and there are a number of ways you can do this, but you know, I, I believe the the preacher as or the pastor as the primary worship leader should be doing things regularly to remind people, you know, kind of the contents of the book. What happens when we worship? Mm-hmm. This is remind them. Um, 
you know, as we as we gather, as, as things are about to begin, rather than just sort of sauntering in with your coffee in hand as music's playing and you kind of join the singing for that opening gathering song, it's, no, let's, let's stop for a second. God is about to speak. I know you, you see Jonathan up here, you see your pastor, but right now the words that are coming from my mouth are actually God's words, and he's using them to speak to all of us, and he says, worship and bow down, right? So, so kind of just re realigning people, re refocusing them. Um, I don't think we necessarily do a good job of that. We, we take for granted that people know that's what's happening. Or, and you, you do touch on this, perhaps there's an anxiety on the part of ministers to tell people what I'm saying to you is actually God speaking to you. You mean they, they feel uncomfortable saying that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, who are you, Pastor, to say that right. God's speaking through you kind of thing? Yeah. And again, then we, we go back to Scripture, which tells us that's exactly what's happening when a pastor preaches. Um, this, now, this isn't Scripture, but the second Helvetic Confession, I think, gets it right on when it says the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. It's one simple sentence. They don't apologize for it. They don't nuance it. But um, that's what we believe, and we do see that in Scripture. Um, First Peter talks about um, the one who speaks, preaches, does so as though he has the oracles of God. Mm. Um, Ephesians uh, talks about how Jesus came and preached peace to the, the people in Ephesus. It doesn't take long to figure out, reading through the Gospels, Jesus was never once in Ephesus. So how could Paul say that Jesus preached in Ephesus? Well, because Paul preached in Ephesus, mm -hmm. and he he understood he was an ambassador. He spoke on behalf of God. So the Scriptures, yes, we can be anxious about that, and I'm not worthy to do this. Well, yeah, I'm not, but God has still called me to this, and this is what he does. Again, it's grace. It's grace, grace that he would use um, weak servants in, in this mighty way. So, so one thing pastors, worship leaders need to do is remind people of what's taking place. Um, uh, another reason uh, church is boring is because some churches think that boredom is actually a badge of honor. Hmm. They, in reaction to the gimmicks, the light show, the, the loudness of the church down the street, they want to say that all we need is the book. We just need the Bible, right? And of course, I would yes and amen that, but to such an extent as um, we don't need to actually engage people with it. We don't need to have lively preaching, engaging preaching. We don't need musical excellence. Um, and if you are bored here, it's, it's kind of uh, on you. You know, you're, you're not holy enough. These aren't things people would say, but that's I think that's another reason. You come into some churches and it feels you know, dry as dirt, and they would say, yeah, because that's how it's supposed to be. I don't think that's true either. In uh, I don't have the passage off the top of my head, but there's um, uh, a place in Acts where it talks about how the way in which, I believe it's Peter preaching, it might be Paul though, but it's the way in which he preached is what what uh, converted and convinced the people, his audience, not just what he said, but the yeah. way in which he said it. Um, so that's important. A third, a third and yeah. final thing for why yeah. church is dull to us sometimes, and maybe the most important one, is because we're dull. <laughs> like, we, we, we walk in, it doesn't matter if the pastor's um, is explaining things, it doesn't matter if the church is doing the best they can to have lively preaching and musical excellence and, and all the rest, and to, to bring it home to us that we are, in fact, meeting with God. Sometimes we're just, we're so distracted by the things of this world, uh, and and we, uh, we uh, judge things based on the things of this world. In other words, like, well, this isn't anything like the production value I see at fill in the blank, that we just automatically assume this is boring. And the answer is no, it isn't boring you um, are not realizing what's taking place. And I think that's the primary reason church is boring. Um, are there outside reasons? Yes, I addressed a few of those, but I think primarily it's an internal ones. So I need to recognize what's taking place. And when I'm having trouble engaging with what's going on in church, m the first place I should look isn't at what they're doing and what they need to change. It's how do I need to change? Mm. So Okay, so I, I wanted to address this exact thing mm -hmm. with a little bit of pushback on um, this this idea that 
in modern society, we've, um, we've adapted, of course, to the technology around us and the proliferation of media and on and on. So we've been conditioned to expect, as you just said, certain levels of production value yeah. that we paradoxically with the um, immediacy of access for information and entertainment, we have less, we seem to have less time than we did before. And if you, if you look at the way that services were, uh, the order of services was, was laid down. Let's go back to Calvin. Cause you mentioned Calvin at times in here and mm-hmm. how he, um, viewed certain elements of the order of worship and the way he laid it out. But isn't it true that Calvin lived at a time when the majority of people were more of, well, it was an agrarian society. So, and the reason I bring that up is because you, you do mention the phenomenon of routine. Yeah. And how important that is. And you talk about your friend who wakes up at five every morning, goes yeah. for a three mile run, does all kinds of things. It's not me, but um, meaning I'm not that friend. <laughs> so, uh, and but you have a different routine that works for you. Yeah, sleeping in till nine, never running, or you don't have to confess any of this. No, right sorry, Ugh, it's too late. <laughs> we'll cut it, take it out and post. No, to, we, <laughs> we will not edit that out, Abby. <laughs> so, here's what I'm trying to get at is the order of worship that was set up generations ago Mm -hmm. seems to make more sense in an agrarian society because as a farmer, let's say, or even sailing a ship or whatever your job was back then, it it required more of that routine. If you didn't follow the routine, if you're like, ah, this morning I'm going to give it 10. Well, maybe your chickens don't get fed or maybe your crops suffer. Okay. But, But... Routine was more built into your life, and so you would be more uh, conditioned as a human being Mm -hmm. to endure a boring church service. Whereas now... Boring. Yeah, we can put that in quotes if you want to, but sometimes they are boring. Or our perception of them is boring. Is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. um, Or the leadership has created they're they're the fault i mean you've helpfully identified there's at least three reasons why church seems boring for the individual or for the corporate gathered body yeah but in today's society we're not primarily agrarian we have a different approach and understanding to what life looks like on a day-to-day basis shouldn't shouldn't we adapt and or here's a better way to phrase it can't we adapt our order of worship that still follows the two underlying principles of regula- regulation mm-hmm. and dialogue? Okay, let me try to answer. Um, I, well, I don't disagree that in ages past people were more used to routine, but I don't think that that um, necessarily applies to the routine in church. Like, the only reason there was a routine in church was, but was because people were were used to routine in their farming life. Um, the purpose of routine in, is the way, as the way I lay it out in the book, you know, borrowing heavily from Jamie Smith at Calvin, is about forming habits, uh, good habits. There's, there's such thing as good routine, right? Mm. Um, and I think that that's a cross-generational thing. That doesn't matter about the, what kind of era you live in, industrial age or an agrarian one. Um, when we come to worship and, and we are reminded we meet with God, He speaks to us first, we confess our neediness, He re- replies in grace, we read His law, which again reveals our sin, we ask for His forgiveness, He assures us of our pardon, now we're prepared to hear His word, now that we've been forgiven, this is how you live for me, and now that you live for me, you have the, the blessing of, of communing with me at the Lord's Supper, and then He sends us out into the world with a benediction that is more than just, a, I'm real pleased with you, but also from my good pleasure, because you have my approval, now live like it and go serve the world. There, there's your pattern, real briefly, of a Reformed service. That 
that routine, if we want to call it that, that pattern creates um, creates something within us. The um, the shape of liturgy shapes us, mm. and so I think a reformed liturgy shapes us as God's. Well, shapes us first as sinners. It, in a sense, it reminds us of who we are because we meet a holy God. But then it also shapes us as saints, those who've been redeemed and pardoned and and are in Christ. All of these things need to be impressed upon us every week. And and it shapes us as servants, those who come to hear from God, then to go out and live for God. Um, having that reminder every week, um, that routine every week, is not... It, we're not holding on to a bygone practice that doesn't apply anymore. That's we need that because of our spiritual amnesia. We forget those things every single day. The reason I sin is because I forget these things. The reason I'm slow to confess my sin is because I forget who God is, and I'm a, I forget that He is slow to anger and He's quick to pardon. Um, so, church to to have to have that kind of order of service um, in church week in and week out, I think does. Um, the Christian untold spiritual good. Mm. Is, that, so, is that helpful answer? Yeah, no, it's really helpful. I, I feel as and though... And I'm going to just slowly wheel away as I cough for a second. Continue, I can hear you. <coughs> oh, good, we're both doing it. <laughs> you can just turn your head to the side. It makes it easier. How are you on time? Oh, you're fine on time. Are we going toe-to-toe? -to -toe? Uh, you're doing great. Okay. Are you uncomfortable at no. all? No. Come on, you can tell me. Oh, it's fun. <laughs> you make you put me at ease, Tavis. I hope so. And Abby's here to protect me too. Because if, if you were looking at Luther the whole time like I am, <laughs> you... <laughs> you, yeah, you're better to look at them. It's why I put this guy, the praying man. That's what I'm doing the whole time. I don't know if the audience can see that, but they can see his hands, but his face. We'll do so, we'll do this on Instagram. We'll put like, yeah. hey, by the way, here's the full image for you guys. Yeah, um, these are by a famous artist. I shouldn't like, actually. He's not famous, but within a certain context, yeah, um, they are uh, lithographs. The guy has passed away now, and I, in order to get these, you email. No, she doesn't have an email. You have to call his sister, <laughs> and she'll pull it on a storage for you. And send it to you, but she won't accept any electronic. You got to mail her a check. Mm -hmm. And uh, she waits till she gets the check. She gets the yeah. check. And and process yeah. it. It's it's beautiful. It's beautifully analog. There you go. Yeah. So like that, church. I think these are both signed by. Um, hold on. I, there is signatures at the bottom of this one. There's two actually. Yeah, it's R O Hodge. Oh, that just says Luther. Yeah, and then the, over there is the R O. <laughs> Yeah, he's got all kinds of... The, he has some uh, quite beautiful ones of Christ, but in this yeah. context, we couldn't show images of Christ. Right. So if you're, if you're into images of Christ, you might like those. But he has... That one's stuck out to me. Anyway, um, let's talk about Luther for a minute, or at least use him as a segue. And actually, this prayer, this, is, this makes a good segue. Um, into one of my main questions, which is this. Uh, you make the argument that there is a difference between how we engage with God, or let's say it better, how he engages with us. Okay. And if I'm wrong in that, correct me. But in how God engages with us in the context of the church setting versus uh, privately. Yeah, I think both would be true, how we engage and how he engages. It I think, goes I both think, ways. I think, yeah, I think it'd be accurate. Because the thing that stuck out to me probably the most from your book, apart from the um, the statement on divine agency mm -hmm. or God being the one who works, mm -hmm. does the work in worship, and we essentially follow his lead, would that be a fair statement? Something to that effect. Okay, okay. <laughs> We're not being. We're not going to be held to this. I, list. I think if, whatever I, you say I, here, you won't be held to it the rest of your life. So. The Philippians two, you know, it's God who works in you both to work and to will, yes. or will and to work. So that's the. Yeah, we're, that still, we're still of, desiring after Him, and we're still uh, serving Him. But it's, He's the one who's working in us to do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's that whole. It's that whole. Uh, <clears throat> 
excuse me, arena of theology that deals with yeah. divine and human agency yep. and the interaction between it. So yeah. we won't go there. We'll set that aside Thank you. for now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get James Smith in here to talk. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so here's the question, though. Um, Pro, yeah, private oh, and public the, worship. Yeah, yeah and, and one of the, th the things that stood out to me the most in your book was when you quoted Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson mm -hmm. and how... He likes the silent before Let church. Let me read it, because okay. it's yeah. really a great quote. And it resonated with me. Clearly, yeah. you're about to read it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there it is. Page 44. By the way, side note, I really appreciate how you tapped into a lot of different sources in here. This isn't just Jonathan Cruz thinking on his own, like your footnoting. No, I can't even do that. So <laughs> <laughs> your footnoting is really good. And, and you do a wide variety of sources. You don't just, you know, quote the gospel coalition or something the whole time. <laughs> no comment. Good. Here's what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. He said, I like the silent church before the service begins better than any preaching. Okay, before you respond, will you respond in the holder? Is <laughs> yeah, you're about two years too late. <laughs> <laughs> is um, well, two years too late because for those who don't know, this was published in 2020, but still relevant today. It's it's isn't it interesting? Well, that's what I was going to say. No idea when I was writing it that it would come out at the high point of a pandemic, and ever mm. since then, it seems to have kind of taken on a new new or a life of its own in the sense of people coming back to this issue in a way that I don't think they would have before the pandemic. So, Well, yeah. absolutely, because we couldn't go to church, a lot yeah. of us. And so we started thinking about these things. So, like, yeah. we couldn't go to church in England. We could not go. Yeah. You were it's, not allowed. Well, the, you know, the same thing here, for, for not as long. And we were departing from Emerson, and that's okay, is... We couldn't go to the church building. Mm -hmm. Well, we couldn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were in London at the time. And um, suddenly this new thing called Zoom Church started. Right. Yeah. And we did not do Zoom Church. We tried. We really did try. We just couldn't do it. So I started just teaching the family at home. Mm -hmm. And um, not according to the Reformed Order of Worship, but we did our own thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, we played some songs. Mm -hmm. uh, I would teach the kids. We were going through Ephesians. Great. Very slowly, uh, which you kind of have to with children, especially with the first few cha first chapter of Ephesians. Yeah, right. But we, we did what we had to do to make sure that uh, our family was being, uh, was engaging with God. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and good on you for that. Well, there are a lot of men and women out there that, did what they had to do, and yeah. and you know now. But, but I can see how this your book even now, because it's going to happen again. I hope not. Well, <laughs> of course it will. <laughs> the, history is like that. There yeah, be but Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus! Right, before right, right. We have another okay, pandemic. Well, whether it's a pandemic or a war, <laughs> sure, or yeah, extreme providences, disaster, yeah. natural disaster, whatever it is. There's reasons why, maybe not on a global scale, but people just can't make it to the church building. So that's why that's where this is leading. Let's get yeah, back. yeah. We can go back to Emerson. This all works. I think we'll see, it yeah. all comes back to that idea of the difference between public and private worship. Yeah. Well, if we can call both of those worship, we can. Yeah, because um, you also go to who? What is her name? The Liturgy of the Ordinary. Is that the book you? Read? Tish Warren. Yeah. There's a third name in there, and I'm trying to think. It's okay. Of, I haven't yeah. read her book, but yeah, it's, it's, a, good, sound, it's a good it book. It sounds reasonable. Is in that um, she's a great author. She's in anything I do, in everything that I'm doing, there there can be an aspect of worship to it. Oh, First Corinthians ten. You know, whether you eat or drink, it, whatever you do, in all things, glorify God. Sure, but that's different than. Engaging with God in the context of the gathered assembly. It is different, but I'm just, I'm, I, first, I'm trying to um, uh, legitimize some of the approaches that are yeah. taken by people like um, uh, Miss Warren in, in that book, um, because it's not, I don't want to say, I don't want to draw too strong a demarcation. Like, mm -hmm. no, no, life isn't worshipful. Well, again, Romans 12 would be another text, right? That, um, 
uh, we're not to be conformed to this world, but by the renewing of our mind, be transformed and to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That sacrifice is worshipful language, a living one, our lifelong, you know, um, act of worship. So there is a sense in which I would say all of life is meant to be worshipful, but that doesn't mean all of life is worship. Maybe we could even say with yeah. a capital W, if that, okay. you know, if okay. that's helpful. Well, let's, let's talk about Emerson again. Okay. <laughs> because, no, this relates. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, this is where all this is going. Is I don't think I'm alone in saying that I prefer the silence of an empty cathedral mm -hmm. to most of the preaching I hear. And maybe that's just my personal experience. And maybe, well, there could be a lot of reasons for that. But there's something about being out in nature usually alone, mm -hmm. that feels more authentic oftentimes in terms of meeting with God than sitting through, well, let's call it a boring sermon. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions for you. Number one, why do I and others, and I would say especially those maybe who are introverts, which I am, mm -hmm. prefer that kind of experience and number two is, is it invalid or is there something, how do I phrase this? Is it invalid or is there something to that? Is, is, or am I getting my experiences mixed up where, where maybe it's, well, actually that pre-service experience of sitting in silence, that's kind of a different thing. It's not invalid, but it's a different thing than what we're, what we're doing in the gathered service. I think I would probably want to go that route. Okay. I mean, if, you, if you're if you truly meditating, you're reflecting on the Lord, you're praying to Him, what, what would be invalid of that? You know, what would be... Why would anybody want to say, don't do that? But um, if, I pref if I prefer but that... But if you prefer it, that's what I would say. The reason you prefer it is perhaps because you don't recognize what happens when we worship. Are you judging right? me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the what can happen in that silence before the sermon, you know, as Emerson says, I prefer the silent church before better than any preaching. Yeah. You know, what doesn't happen in the silent church, God doesn't speak to you. We just we established that earlier on, right? The preaching of the word of God is the word of God. But what if um, I'm okay. What if I'm reading scripture? Mm hmm Well that that's a, we're getting closer. If I'm praying <laughs> Getting closer, you're communing with God, and I'm not those saying means... I'm not saying I'm hearing an audible voice. No, no, no. I hear, I understand, but your communion prayer some, is communion with God. There's something sure. about like maybe being still before the Lord. Absolutely, right. But um, so yeah, we're talking about public private worship, and is it is it bad to prefer the one over the other? Is it bad to prefer that moment of silence where you might be reading your Bible alone, um, praying to God, as opposed to coming into corporate worship where you're sometimes bored out of your mind. Um, I've just completed editing a new book for, for RHB um, on, uh, for the Puritan Treasures for Today series that uh, Jay Collier's the series editor, and um, uh, taking three treatises from the Puritan David Clarkson, who was a minister in, in London um, before your time. He was the associate minister for John Owen, and then John Owen passed away, and he became the pastor of that church. And uh, he's got one treatise in particular on um, public worship to be preferred before private or over private worship. Okay, I, I make a you do I you reference, do him, reference him reference him yeah. reference him in the book, and so then I had the opportunity to go through uh, and really dig into to this treatise, which is wonderful, um, and. He has a really, a really good section about, let's say all of that's true, what you've just said, what, what, uh, what you prefer, that you actually enjoy it better. Then, then what do we say? Um, 
And he gives all these reasons why, no, public, because, because of the manifestation of God. God is more manifest in public worship than in private. Um, there are more spiritual benefits in public worship than private. We're more edified. Uh, we're prevented better. Um, he says public ordinances are a better security against apostasy than private, right? You know, if you're just left to yourself and your own interpretation of the Scripture, as opposed to the teaching of the Church, the Church as a whole, down through the ages with creeds and confessions, but then even through ordained ministers, you know, exposing God's Word, you're less likely for backsliding and falling into error in public worship. So he gives all these reasons um, but then at the end, and this is what I wanted to read, if I can find it here, um, you know, what happens if you you truly, in the end of the day, just like it better, and you can't change that. I just, I just, I like it better. Um, so if you give me one second. No, take your time. Yeah. Take your time. Um, because, and while you're looking it up, you don't have to listen to me, but I'll keep talking. Okay. Is, um, I was thinking there are there are differences, in... and I did find it. So no, go ahead. Do you have a search function? Yeah, but I say I found it, so I'm ready. Oh, you did find yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead, and then I'll bring up my. Point. Okay. He says, "Let us suppose you truly did find more comfort and benefit in private than in public worship. Let's just grant it. Even so, the glory of God is to be preferred over your preferences." You must prefer what most advances God's glory, not what most promotes your particular interests. And God is most glorified in public worship, which he's just given a whole chapter defending that. Here in corporate praise is given, now he's defending a little further. In corporate praise is given the most ample testimony to his glorious excellencies and the most public acknowledgement of his glory. There is no way that we can glorify him without acknowledging his glory. And the more public the acknowledgement, the more he is glorified. It is most public in public worship, and therefore this is as much to be preferred before private as the glory of God should be preferred before your private advantages. Mm. And whew, that just got me. He's like, you know what? I, he gives all these arguments, but he says, in the end of the day, if I haven't convinced you, it really doesn't matter. If you like it better, what you need to take away is that God doesn't like it better. God likes public worship better, and his glory and his preferences are greater than our own uh, our, our own preferences. So I found that to be very helpful. So that should be coming out uh, um, shortly, I think, um, in, in the next few months. Okay. It'll, be, it'll be under the title, Prizing Public Worship by David Clarkson, mm. three different treatises mm. that we uh, pulled together. But I thought that was that's really helpful, especially in our context. COVID put everybody back at home, and some people are thinking, you know, I kind of like this better. I can do this on my own. There's so many... I mean, I could go on for the reasons why, why you know, Zoom church isn't good. When you're able to mute the pastor... <laughs> mute the word of God, yeah. you know, there's been a reverse in authority, right? Now, God, you stand over God because you have the ability to, to, to turn off the, the Zoom link or whatever, as opposed to corporate worship, where literally we sit under the God, of, you know, the word of God in most churches with the pulpits raised. Um, there's something powerful to that, that that you miss when you're doing your own thing, or even you're at home watching something. I, I, I prefer, my, my preference is to talk about that when you are hindered from uh, going to uh, corporate worship, and you have the ability to live stream a service, you are, you're, you're watching worship take place, but mm. you are not part of that worship, strictly speaking. Yeah. Which isn't to say that that's not a worshipful moment for you. I hope that people, when that happens, especially I think of, you know, people who are shut in and can't get in regularly, that they really are engaged as much as they can be, trying to sing along, listening to the sermon. But at the same time, we have to say there's something different about, you're not part of the assembly. You're not part of those who are called out, called together in the church. So I like to just caution the language, or to be careful with the language and say, you are you're in, um, you're encountering worship from afar. You're you're watching worship. You're not participating in in worship, strictly speaking. Okay, that's fair. That's a fair point. Thanks, as we would say in England. But are you, is there a but coming? There's all yeah, yeah. Of course there's a but. But I I'm not sure if I would agree with the fact that public is to be preferred. Well. Okay, let's talk about... And of course, uh, Clarkson's, and it's, this is in the book, that comes from Psalm 87, I believe, verse 2. Okay. It's in the 80s somewhere. 
the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than any of the private dwelling places of Jacob. Okay. So there, that's this, and he, he takes that and he runs with it. He's saying yeah. God actually prefers that thronging around the corporate mm-hmm. place of the, the city, Zion, yeah. than the, the personal private dwellings of, of Jacob. I think that's Psalm 87 uh, too. Interesting. So my mind then immediately goes to the tabernacle. Okay. And the temple, of course, mm-hmm. and just... It, it, it's always struck me as interesting that God decided to locate himself. I know that, you know, I'm not saying theologically that God only restricted himself to being present in the temple. Sure. But, but there whatever was, there reason, was an, he directed a, a special, his people to worship a special him manifestation. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's always been quite Together, corporately. Together, corporately. And yeah. the fact that it happened to be the same location. Uh, where Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac. You know. For the temple, yeah. Right, yeah. so Mount Zion, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so, okay, so back to my counter, though, is, and only because I speak from experience, like, in my family or yeah. people that I've known who maybe had uh, family members with, let's say, special needs. Mm-hmm. You did mention people who perhaps cannot leave their sure. their mm-hmm. domicile, whatever it is. Um we're not all the same. Like as human beings, we have differences in the way that we perceive or react or engage with the world around us. So isn't it, isn't it fair to say that some people might have a better experience with those silent moments of devotion in the morning than on a Sunday or well, I guess you could answer that, but the other thing I was going to say is maybe the language that we're using of preference is kind of talking about it on one level, but then there's another way of talking about it as um, uh, th- there's a way that we could look at use the term private experience. and public being part of the same thing, which is our relationship with God. That, in a way, what we do on a Sunday is so valuable for many of the reasons we've discussed, but also because it affects and impacts and directs what happens all the other six days of the week when you're not there. Absolutely. So what happens if you remove that day? You know, the others will be Exactly. So if you remove that day and you make all seven days this private experience... Yeah. So now I feel like we're on the same page and this isn't so much a, a pushback. Because I would agree you with see, that. See, as I'm asking you the question, I'm working it out in my head. <laughs> yeah. And I'm saying, actually, maybe Jonathan is right. Well, it's not me, but I believe Scripture is what you're right. Saying see, is the right. thing with experience, would I disagree with experience? Uh, no, but... What, the, what do you mean by... Ex- what you, do you said maybe it's some people's experience that they encounter God better or in private than in public. That was You just said that a few sentences ago, used that term, experience. Mm. And you know what we would have to say is... What is the the rule by which we establish our spiritual habits? Is it our experience or is it God's word? Right, experience is not an infallible guide. Um, God's word is the infallible guide, and God's word has established very clearly that what please what brings a smile to God's face and what God's people need is that corporate, that regular, habitual corporate gathering of God's people to praise Him and to hear from Him, to be instructed by His Word, and then to go out into the world. So as you've just said, that, that one-day encounter does affect the rest of the week, not only in our private devotions, our family devotions, but even just in our acts of De- uh, or our deeds of love and mercy, our acts of service mm-hmm. in, in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's God's pattern, and we want to um, base our our practices off of what God tells us, not what we feel. And that's move, and move that from, that applies to and that applies to to all sorts of things, not just worship. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many different arguments in the church. I don't want to bring them up because then we'll start talking about them. But people would say, well, you know, in my experience, X, so I don't know why why it shouldn't be. Why can't we do this? Because I had a good experience with this thing. Well, you might have, but experience isn't the rule. God's Word is the rule. Okay, so so those private experiences we have with God, yeah. I mm-hmm. think we can say that they are with God. I mean, we, we have... 
Well, it depends. I, of well, course. I mean, even our it, doctrine of the the omnipresence of God would dictate, right? Or that even we, natural we, we, revelation and scriptural revelation, exactly. Right? Yep. So those are the sky proclaims, of course. So we're learning yeah. something of God. Yeah. So I okay. don't deny that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hope that's clear. No, that's absolutely clear. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's yeah, that's helpful. I um, there's another aspect of your book that I, I wanted to touch on that I think is really important that I guess we could call it Eden and Eternity. Can you maybe you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? Oh, you got you got the uh, alliteration down. Eden and Eternity, I guess that's good. It's you did it. I, why not on purpose? I don't re- I don't remember that. <laughs> so the the worship that we have in the garden we, that, so Eden means we were how is it? You lay the foundation of what worship is. This goes. Th- now we're going back to the beginning of your book. Okay. Yeah. Again, I That's don't want to walk through the whole book because I really want people to buy this and read it. Yeah. And especially, well, let's get practical. Be- you've got discussion questions in the back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys can all see that, um, which I found really. I didn't do them, by the way. That's okay. I will. <laughs> you can send me your answers. I'll grade them. No, don't don't say that. Don't say. That. I'll use Chat GPT to write them out, and then I use Chat GPT to write the book. So, oh, good for you. Back in twenty twenty, you, Back in you 20- liar. <laughs> Chat GPT one point Yeah, <laughs> that's why I have so many problems with your book. No, <laughs> that's not true. Um, you're laying the foundation of why it is that we worship, or what, like I think you're defining what worship is. Give me a second here. We're talking about that why it's the most important thing we do. That could be what you're thinking of. Well, you're rooting worship in creation mm-hmm. and consummation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's another alliteration. Yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah, <laughs> write the follow-up. Um, explain that. Um, yeah, so in the context of the book, it's it's in a chapter talking about uh, how worship is the most important thing we do in this life, and how, how can I make that claim? And the claim is, well, the way I call it in the book is the, the, <laughs> the argument from internal design to uh, mm. eternal destiny. But oh, that's way better. Creation, consummation, yeah. and it's, it's all the same idea. So, okay. so the, the, the first and fundamental thing is that we were made to worship, and the Shorter Catechism tells us as much, man's chief end his telos, his purpose, why mm-hmm. is he here, why does he exist, mm-hmm. to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Yeah. And and in, indeed, Eden is this kind of first worship center. It is where humanity, mankind, communes with, with um, their creator. Okay, so I'm going to stop you here because you just helped me recall okay. something that came to mind. So in your introduction, of course, you talk about some of the impetus for writing this is that, hey, people perceive worship as boring mm-hmm. and they shouldn't because we're actually engaging with God. Mm-hmm. Well, Adam and Eve were engaging with God in worship with God. Mm-hmm. And yet, it, like, were they bored? Like, why? what happened to them? So It's this thing called created, the fall. Yes, I know, I know. But I'm saying <laughs> it, it's not more, it's kind of a rhetorical question. It's like, hey, look, Ab, Adam and Eve yeah. had a hard time with it. Yeah. No wonder we do too. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So they they um, they did not see it as the most important thing uh, that, that they were called they to do. They got distracted. They got distracted and they had um, this, you know, um, thoughts of grandeur. Maybe I should be the one being worshipped. I mean, isn't that what Eve's thinking when, when the devil says, no, he knows you'll become God. So oh, well, mm. that doesn't sound so bad, yeah. right? Um, but but this is this is what we were created to do. Another place um, that proves that is Romans 1, I reference in that chapter, because Romans 1 talks about the natural, even post-fall, we're still, this is still part of our h- human DNA, is, is that we are worshipful, worshiping creatures. Romans 1 talks about the natural man suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, and then it goes on to say, and therefore he worships, he worships the creature rather than the creator. Mm. So truth is suppressed, but worship isn't. Hmm. Worship needs to come out. We just need to do it. Why? Because we're made to do it. It's, it's just who we are. Just a bird needs to fly. We need to worship. So now post-fall, we worship all sorts of, we worship the wrong things or we worship in the wrong way. But 
nevertheless, we can argue it's the most important thing we do because it's what we were made to do. Uh, what's the most important thing um, a car does? Is it that it, you know, warms your bottom on a cold morning because you have heat warmers? Yeah. Is it that it, it plays music for you because it has a radio? No, the most important thing a car does is what it was ultimately made to do, which is to take you from point A to point B. But Okay, we know, we know what a car does. Let's very, talk more about that. Very. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> we, we know what a car does. Yeah. It takes you point A to point B. It drives. Yeah. We know all that. We know yep. the machinations, even on a basic level. What is worship, though? Like, there's so many misunderstandings, I feel like, in yep. the contemporary church, or well, probably throughout the history of the church. Yes. It, like, Israel got it wrong. Right, the the golden calf. It goes all the way back to that, right. or before it goes to the even now. We're you're, you're wanting to give me a basic definition. Like just what, what meeting is, with God, communing with God. Communing is probably better. I think engaging, engaging, communing, communing yeah, encountering God. So and, the essence of worship is not um, us singing to God or us um, doing things to make God happy. No, it, but actually, no, that's not the essence. The essence, the is, essence is relationship. Is the, the, yeah, Can the, we say that? Well, the, the encounter, which, which when you encounter God, especially when you encounter God in the gospel, it, it must, it necessitates adoration and praise. Those things will be there. True worship will, be, uh, will include adoring the Lord and praising the Lord and, and giving thanksgiving to Him. Um, you know, if, I'm just trying to think of an you know, example, if, if somebody, um, an anonymous donor, uh, you know, gave um, my family found out we were in hard times and wrote us a check for you know a hundred thousand dollars, and then later on I, I come to learn who that was, and I get to meet this person, I, I'm encountering them, I'm engaging, I'm meeting with them, right? Mm -hmm. If I know that's what they've done for me, that that engagement, that encounter has to include thanksgiving, gratitude. Mm. To, to meet the person and to not thank them for what they've done wouldn't really be to meet them fully. Yeah. So I think worship is something like, yeah, we're, we're engaging God, but it has to include that kind of that um, overflow of the soul, right? That, which, is what worship, which, what, it, which is what praise is, right? That the Lord has done so much, we must praise Him. We must um, thank Him. We want to bow before Him and hear from Him and, and do what He says because of who He is. So, yeah, that's kind of a brief overview. What is, what is worship? What were we made to do? That's what we were made to do. But it's also what we're remade to do. That gets to that consummation idea. Um, Jesus says salvation is, is about worship. John chapter 4, when he's speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, he says that um, the Father is... There's, there's a time coming when, when true worshipers will gather and worship in spirit and truth, and the Father is seeking such worshipers. Mm. And it's interesting, it's the only time that verb seeking is applied to the, the Father's actions. What, what does God seek after? What's He looking for? Well, the Bible only one time tells us, and it's worshipers. And that's, that's kind of the end goal of redemption. Not kind of, it is. That is the end goal of redemption, is that all of God's people from every tribe, language, nation, and tongue would gather around the throne of the Lamb on the last day and, and cry glory and to sing praise and honor we are, we are made to worship, but then the fall ruined that, and God says, I'm not content to leave you with your misplaced, misplaced worship, your warped worship. I'm going to redeem you so that you worship the way you were always meant to, so that we can commune with one another the way we were always meant to. And so that's what we see in Revelation. And again, it's corporate worship. It's not private worship, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, myriads upon myriads uh, coming together in that corporate assembly in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. That's funny. We're not like going to wander off to some corner of the clouds and be like, I'm "No, gonna worship God over here." No, yeah. So that whole, you know, what yeah. we've been talking about earlier, that 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 whole desire, I think, will immediately dissipate when we <laughs> get to heaven. We'll want to magnify. You know, we we cannot make God glorious when we talk about glorifying Him. It's not that He's not glorious without us, but we can make Him in the words of one Puritan, seem more glorious. That's what it means to glorify him, to, to magnify his name. When we get to heaven, we're going to want to do that. We're going to realize we can't do it on our own. I mean, it seems like we are so inadequate to that task as it is. Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that... So there's a little bit of hubris you know. or pride to think that all I need is, you know, me and Jesus in a corner with a good book. Yeah. You, th you think... 
you think that uh, your your communion with Christ or your your honor of Christ is in and of itself is is sufficient for all that he's done? Yeah, and it gets back to this idea of church being boring. I guess it really is our fault. Like the fact that I want to check my phone in a church service, there's something in me that isn't understanding what's going on. Right. It's not understanding what worship is. I mean, you would never you would never check your phone. You would never doze off. You would never look at your watch and think, why is he still going right but I'm, now? I'm human, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so am I, and that's why I do these things as well. But yeah. I'm saying, but when we when we really like get it, when we really get it, though, we would but never do this. There's struggle, and, and it needs to, we need to keep being reminded of what happens. Yeah. Because after the chaos of a Sunday morning, which, by the way, you give some very helpful practical tips on how to. Yeah, sure. Uh, preempt those horrible things that happen on a Sunday morning, especially <laughs> in the car drive. <laughs> <over>. <laughs> especially with little kids, yeah. Um, is all that stuff gets in the way, and then suddenly I forget again. What what is it that I'm here for? Why am I? Yeah. Why am I here and not still in bed? And, and you know, just to, to that to that point, the silence before church is helpful in that sense. I don't mm. want to throw that out. I mean, yeah. I, I, Emerson is completely wrong when he says, I like that better than the preaching. Yeah. But there's something, I think, important of having a, a moment of silence or preparation before a call to worship um, because, because we're human, because some of us are you know, lugging kids in from the car who are crying about they didn't get the book they wanted to bring into church or they don't have the right snack or their socks all kind of you know, scrunched up in their shoe, whatever it is, and we get in, we're all, we're all flustered, and now God calls us to worship like as though we're expected to immediately be able to, to mm-hmm. flip that switch. Mm-hmm. None of us can do that. So to be able to have a time where we can okay, just take a deep breath, remember why we're here, remember what's happening and let those other things kind of fade away as much as we're as much as we are humanly uh, able to to do that of course with the with the help of God. Yeah. Well, um let me ask you a final question is for the the church leaders that will listen to this. Yeah. and read your book. Um how would you encourage them when in particular they they feel like people so let's say you're a pastor <coughs> You read this book, um, maybe you've heard that you listen to this podcast and you get inspired and you think, you know, I need to encourage my people to understand what's actually happening in this context we do every Sunday. But um, how would you encourage them when they meet pushback, whether it's uh, direct pushback of like people want more of the excitement thing Mm -hmm. or they want to stay with their dull thing? Or if it's, yeah. a, or if it's a pushback that's a bit more actually sinister, which is just, I'm gonna not engage and I'm going to ignore and just you know thanks for that word, Pastor, but we're good. Like how do you yeah. how do you how do you change people's minds when they've it's been so ingrained in them that oh yeah. no this is what worship is yeah. we're happy with this. A lot of patience. A lot of intentional teaching, preaching on the subject. Hebrews twelve for me has been one of the the most helpful, which which gives us in such succinct language um, what is what is happening when we worship, and it says that you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, um, the heavenly Zion, and it talks about where we're at and who else is there. Innumerable angels in festal gathering. Mm. That's when you're worshiping, you're with angels. Um, the saints who've been perfected, that is, the, 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 those deceased brothers and sisters in Christ of old, they're there with us too. Um, so and, now we're getting into like angelology and... Well, maybe a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but then it says, and you've come to Jesus. Mm. That, that's, that in and of itself should be enough. Uh, of course, we're sinners. We want, we want more things. <laughs> but wow, to learn that... I come to, let's say, you know, you walk in and your church, it's 40 people, it doesn't look like anything, you're running a school building and the acoustics aren't great and, uh, you know, the pastor's doing his best, but let's just be honest, this just kind of seems anticlimactic. Mm. You know, this is supposed to be the highlight of my week and I feel like we're starting at a, starting off at a really low point. Um, 
then we need to remember what's really taking place and something that we can't see uh, to the naked eye. But spiritually, by faith, we can believe this, we can see this, um, that when we come to church, we've come to the largest church that there is in the universe. Mm. It's, it's that... It's the universal uh, church triumphant in glory, right? We get to be a part of that even now while we're still here on earth. Uh, it's a spiritual reality, capital S, the Holy Spirit does this work, but wow, we get to worship with with the angels, the perfect sinless angels who've been worshiping from before the world was made. We're worshiping with those saints who have endured, have run the race, they're there. Um, and Jesus is there. I'm with Jesus right now, truly. That, that should be enough. Um, a word, though, maybe also to encourage pastors is maybe people aren't uh, buying it, they're getting pushed back, is just to remember the privilege that it is to be a worship leader um, in the Church of God. I wanted to read from Psalm uh, 42, mm-hmm. which is a psalm of lament, right? That's the one that starts out as a deer pants for flowing streams, my soul thirsts for you, for the living God. And talks about his tears, but then he says, this is what he remembers. This is why he's crying out to God, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise and multitude-keeping festival. To not be able to be a worship leader was something that brought tears to the psalmist. This is what he loved. This was his... This was his, um, this is what got him through, you know. It's like, I, got, I get to be a part of this. I get to lead people to bring them before the house of God and, and to feast with the Lord. Um, he's lamenting that that's been taken away from, from him. Mm-hmm. For those of us who are privileged to have, that, to have that, for it not to be taken away from us, that that's what we get to do week in and week out, well, then far from having tears or anxiety or, or despair, we should have those shouts of joy. Oh, I get to do this. What a privilege I get to lead people into, as it were, the heavenly places where we meet with God, we meet with Jesus Christ, and we join in that, that greatest of all assemblies and do the most important thing we could ever do. We could worship. Mm. What, what a privilege that pastors have mm. to lead people in that. So I hope that can be an encouragement um, to those who maybe are having times of frustration, just to remember that this is this is a extreme privilege and a blessing to be to be a leader in God's church. I see your passion, brother. I mean, that's I hear it. I, I've never thought about it that way. I honestly, my entire life, have never thought of church as being in the presence of angels, the saints, and Christ. Mm. It's it's strange. It almost sounds mystical. It is. But that's not bad. No, I you know I would say like it's I would say just you know in terms of sure if you want to verbiage, qualify it. Well, I would say it's mysterious and it's marvelous. Yeah. Mystical, you know, has some connotations. Sure, but but it's sure. true. It's like wow, this is it is a mystery. Because I've spent time in churches, whether it's visiting or whatever, where you're surrounded by stone statues that right. are maybe saints or. Uh, people from the Bible, whatever it is. You know, in, in London, for example, we would go to St. Paul's Cathedral at times. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And, beautiful. Um, I mean, and right? incredibly beautiful. And you're looking up in the from the inside, <coughs> uh, inside the dome, you're seeing Moses and Abraham and um, the minor prophets. Most people don't even preach on the minor prophets. And you're looking up there at, at these, well, figures of these men. But what you're saying is that, no, it's, there's a mystery that's happening that we don't see it, but... Um, well, it's even, better, it's even kinda, better than that. Well, this right. is kind of creepy, but they see you. Yeah. <laughs> We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Yeah. Right? And, that, and that happens in the church context. Yeah. Rather than... So would that be a, a distinction between Absolutely. public and private worship? Absolutely. I Hebrews, mean, that alone, Hebrews 12 is very clear. That alone is such a huge watershed yeah. 
Absolutely. Phenomenon. The, the, the repeated, you have come, you have come, you have come in Hebrews 12. Mm. Right? Not, not to that, that which can be touched with the thunder and the, the lightning and the sound from heaven that made everybody you know, tremble and ask that Moses would, no, we don't want to do this. But no, instead you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem, to, and it lists all these things. You have come, and you've come to God and to Christ, the mediator of a, a better covenant whose blood speaks a better word of the blood of Abel. In every instance, it's you all, it's y'all, it's second person plural. Mm -hmm. You all have come. Mm -hmm. You all have come. Mm -hmm. It's corporate. Mm -hmm. This is the blessing reserved for the corporate assembly. Wow. And hopefully that excites people about what's coming up on Sunday. I mean, it excites me. Good. I, I'm honestly thinking in my head as you're talking about Almost, well, I guess I am praying, Lord, help me to remember this Sunday morning mm. when I'm standing there a little bit sweaty from running the kids out of the house, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> making sure we're all good to go, you know, trying yeah. not to break the speed limit driving there. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Hey, I hear you. Yeah. And, and I need that too. Yeah. I wrote a book on it, but I need that reminder every single Sunday. We've, we are forgetful creatures. That's, no, I appreciate your you know, humility because yeah. people might read this and be like, wow, I'll never be like Jonathan Cruz. No, yeah. no. And no. <laughs> have a perfect church like he does and remember all these things every single Sunday as I'm up there trying to minister to people. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I wrote it to help me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time. I think, I think oh, time, need time I do need to go here in a, a minute, so... Hey, man, it's been really good to have you on here. Thanks so much. I didn't know where this conversation was going to go, and that's the whole point You and of me it. both. And I'm really... In fact, I didn't plan us to start out with um, your, your hymns, but I'm glad we did. I think it made a great segue in, and yeah, great. I honestly wish more people would... Uh, more churches would get a hold of this and, and make hymns a priority. Yeah, and they're, and they're all available. So there's 25 there, but um, there's many more on the website as I keep writing them. Maybe there'll okay. be a volume two, but uh, hymnsofdevotion.com. And, and the idea is that it's it's a free resource, so people yeah. can listen to recordings of them. There's a little blurb about the theology behind yep. them, download free PDFs. So we want it to be a resource to the church. So Okay, so yeah, last thing, where can people find you? So hymnsofdevotion.com. Yeah. And where else? I'm. Uh, if, if you mean social media, I sure. I don't. So oh, good for you. Hymnsofdevotion.com. That's that's your yeah. media. Uh, yeah, they can go to the church website, and I think I have some contact info if people your want to reach out. Your church again is uh, oh, uh, Community Presbyterian Church. We're in the OPC and down in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So okay. KalamazooCPC.org. Um, you can find sermons on there and and, okay. and all the rest. Great. So. Thanks, man. It's been good to Thank have you. you up here, and you're you're not too far away, so we'll get you up again. Because uh, I do want to talk about your uh, your other book, the Christian. Yeah, True wonderful. Identity. And there's a few others coming out with with RHB. You know, as I mentioned, the Clarkson book. As you just book. mentioned, yeah, and um, a, a devotional on the shorter catechism that okay. should, should be coming out also um, eminently. So I would love to, and that that one co-written with. Um, Two other pastors, Bill Bokestein, who's done a number mm -hmm. of RHB books, yep. and um, an OP minister in Virginia, Andrew Miller, a really gifted writer, gifted pastor. Um, but yeah, put together a year-long devotional through the Shorter Catechism, and really looking forward to sharing that with uh, yeah. the, the broader public soon. Okay, we'll get you back in. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone.